Sure. Thank you, Edu. Just let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we see it. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Welcome also from my side to this webinar. And I will guide you through the model driven engineering part of this project, focusing on um, what domain specific modeling languages we used in Ampere and how we extended these to also cope with the new developments that we are addressing within a pair. So jump right into that. So what we we use uh, model-driven engineering mostly, and in this time we focus mostly on the non-functional part, as Ido already explained, and not on the functional integration, that we want to have some insight in the system behavior when we analyze um, our models that we where we have our system um, presented. So we want to really understand what's happened in the dynamic behavior of the system, but also what are current in development, but also sometimes when they are already in the field to see what, what are the maybe problems that we detect during the runtime. Um, we want to also make during the development for acquisition or in planning also try to understand what the system could look like in the future, make uh, design choices, uh, assess them, uh, based on requirements, see if this could work or not. So, and do it on model level before implementing them. This is way more efficient to do a what if analysis on model level, explore different options before we really do doing the implementation. And uh, what we can derive from it is um, identify early and during the development of the system um, opportunities. So we can derive configurations for the operating system, like um, scheduling parameters, mapping the decisions, we can decide where to deploy our software components on the platform, where we deploy our data, where we map this in the memory, if we have a real-time system platform in the past, um, how we can exploit also the parallelisms of the new hardware platforms that we are looking at, and how can we also um, adhere to the requirements, for example, of event chains that we have in the system. In Ampere, we have two different um, use cases and coming from two different domains. So we um, have also two different modeling languages that we are um, um, using in the project. One is um, uh, Capella, and this is um, this is from uh, developed at Talit and um, was also deployed with it. It's an open source framework that. Um, follows the Acadia method to design systems. So it has four layers and there are two separate major layers that are there. One is um, the needs layer on top, where you can define basically what you want to accomplish uh, uh, for the system, what missions do the system have, and um, what the system should do to contribute to this, um, uh, to accomplish these, uh, accomplish these um, needs. And then we have the solution architecture where we um, can uh, define how the solution looks like, how to fulfill these requirements, um, describe also the logical architecture, considering technology choices and how to reuse them. And there's a traceability between all of these layers to really and to enable an impact analysis uh, between these layers. So if we can fulfill the needs with our solutions that we defined. And this is a more abstract description of the system. And then we have as a second level, the um, Amathea model, which is a model that's also an open source framework and was uh, is focusing on um, the automotive domain, was inspired by Autozar uh, ex um, um, execution semantics. So we can define the dynamic architecture of our systems there, going really down to describing what tasks are running, what runnables are executed, how they are activated, what is the timing of these runnables on different hardware cores or accelerators, and also which data accesses. So, and this was really developed in the past to make the shift from um, single core to multi-core systems to understand the concurrent behavior of the system, to have a representation, especially for the performance analysis of this, to do data consistency checks on the platform itself, to um, also um, um, 
yeah, um, uh, make a performance analysis in this in this system. Also to do optimization on the system during the development of the process to understand the parallel behavior. And um, we combined these two models, as Edo already showed, um, in this project. So we have the more abstract um, the modeling of the system in Capella, um, for the target use case, especially for the operation and system analysis and the logical architecture. And we have uh, an overlap of, um, of abstraction with a high physical architecture, where we have software and hardware structures, data flows, and a coarse grain deployment and mapping. And the details uh, below that are modeled then in Amathea in Ampere, so that we can really go down to um, hardware characteristics, performance, clock domain to see how the energy consumption is. Um, we can define also constraints on data timing and parallelism. And uh, the colleagues at PRT and Thales develop a bridge here where um, there's a non-destructive way to keep this model in sync so that you can start to design in Capella Gener uh, generate an Amathea model and add no new information, more detailed information in Amathea, and uh, still do, can do updates from Campana without uh, destroying the Amathea model and keeping these updates intact. And um, on this Amathea model, then we are basing the Ampere analysis, and uh, this is how the project works. One more detail about the Amathea platform. So the colleagues from uh, GLSI and Tyler are coming more from the compiler side in, the, in developing their systems, while the automotive domain has other ways of, uh, in, in, in Bosch, we have other ways of creating these Amathea models. So we have different partially open source, partially internal tools, where we can, can create Amathea models from source code analysis, partially from binaries for some platforms, from AutoSAR descriptions and traces and measurements. And we use this model for different uh, purposes, for example, for simulation with um, commercial tools. There are something like timing architects from Vector and Incron, Consim, that we can do non-function performance simulation. We have uh, some validation checks, data consistency checks. We have a tool called Locomo where we can do um, optimal uh, placement of memory on this classical real-time platforms that we have in the past. And we also have uh, other tools where we can generate specifically for some domains this model from other design tools similar to Capella and also generate code from it. And the two things we are focusing in uh, Ampere on this ecosystem is we extended the Amathea model for some parts and we extended the synthetic load generator, which I'll explain later. So how did we extend this? meta model to cope with all the challenges that Ido already explained. Um, one thing is that we, because we are now dealing with this heterogeneous platforms with accelerators, which can have different implementations for the same functionality running on a CPU core, running on a GPU, running on an FPGA, for example. And the question is, how can we model this uh, in, in MSCR? And that's why we extended um, the model with some local mode labels that you can um, define a context for, for example, a runnable. This looks like this. So we have um, a runnable that has a local label. They can say they have different implementations options. This is basically a mode set where we can choose from which implementation we, we, we want to analyze. We can also have here then the, the modeling of these runnable with different implementations. So they can also differ in terms of timing and data access is what happens really in the runnable. So we can have, for example, something that is executed uh, on the host with OpenMP, something that's executed with OpenMP or sequentially. And these are the possibilities we now have. And this just makes us also easier to model this in advance, even before implementing and making some more differences upfront. What we also did as a second thing, we extended the model for the new PubSub middlewares that we are envisioning, like AutoSAR Adaptive, or if you want to use something like, like ROS in your system. Um, this was not there in the past in, in classical AutoSAR systems, so we did some um, extensions to the model, so support for 
different activation schemes um, that are coming with this pub sub architecture so you can activate on data um, dependencies or if data is available and we extended our channel concept also that we can model what is really happening when a data comes in and how is the functionality reacting to it so for example, it could be that there's just a callback called, I take one data point, do the execution, are done, and then execute again when I when when another data comes in. I can also just loop over um, a channel and just empty the buffer uh, until it's uh, really until it's empty and do all executions uh, sequentially in this runnable. And we wanted to model something like this. And we also reuse these local labels then, and we can for example, do a while loop and um, then uh, decrement this this while loop every time we are we are going through this while loop and saying we're taking a data out and until the data store is not empty, we can just run this while loop. Next thing we extended within Ampere is the synthetic load generator. So the synthetic load generator was an initial idea because of these heterogeneous platforms that are hard to analyze because of the interference effects and the parallel possibilities that we have there. So we wanted to have something for these integration platforms, the upcoming integration platforms in automotive where we can estimate, for example, sensitivity of application to interference. So if you're now switching from classical SRAM to DRAM, there's higher, higher interference on the platform. How we can do this? We can make estimates with a synthetic load generator. How is integration going on if we now have a switch from OEM and one supplier to multiple suppliers that are integrated in the same platform. Can we do something upfront? What if analysis directly on the platform to understand what's happened there? Can I evaluate also the impact of these new pops up middleware communication architectures like autos are adaptive? What is the overhead? What is the performance impact if I push everything to autos are adaptive or ROS? Um, infrastructure? And this is the, what I want to see. And this is why we created the synthetic load generator to see this directly on the platform because it's hard to analytically capture everything of, of this information. The basic simple idea is that we can describe our system in, in Amathea with some software characteristics for the runtime, memory accesses, data types, something like that. And then we can generate basically executable code. And the focus is here, what happens really on the shared resources and on the communication infrastructure. So we abstract from the core architecture, we assume that we just say, okay, the execution of the just calculation takes this amount of time. And what happens when I access data concurrently from different cores? What, ha what happens if I use a middleware to communicate between uh, different functionalities? And I want to see this overhead. So we just generate simple um, tick snippets where we just burn time and then we access data really on the memory with the memory footprint of the application to understand what happens on shared resources. And it generates basically the synthetic code, some build environment, and also if we use autos adaptive, this uh, RNXX file that we need for that. And the goal was always to have something generating executables that can be deployed directly on the ECU. The framework grew over the time of Ampere. So we had it uh, already in the beginning, a basic model transformation framework that is extendable with Google Shoes, which makes it quite easy to make extensions. We have a basic um, transformator already for the synthetic load generator to generate these tick snippets and some, some dummy um, memory accesses. And we already had this simple autos are adaptive middleware generation internally. What we extended within Ampere is that we, to also mimic autos are adaptive, of course, this is for, for an internal software platform that is not available outside. We extended this to ROS2 and MicroROS. So we can do the communication of our pub sub mechanisms for these integration platforms with ROS2 or on lower level autos of platforms with micro ROS. We have uh, extended, and when I say we, I mean the, the project completely, not Bosch alone. Everybody did some parts here. We can also use, uh, we also generate this open IP um, pragmas directly from the model. We can use FRED as an FPGA offloading technique. We had already Linux with some pthreads um, in place that we could generate, and the colleagues um, in, the, in the project also extended it to Erica OS, so we can deploy code on an Erica OS system with a micro ROS communication stub and talk to, for example, a Linux platform that hosts a ROS2 component. And we will see this later in the project. 
And one more thing that I want to mention is uh, the extensions we did also for custom codes. So when we talk about this what if integration use cases that we see there, sometimes code is already available, sometimes code is not available, and there we use some model descriptions. But if code is already available, we can also integrate it directly in the synthetic code generator. So we can define for some functions or tasks already basically a hook into a real code where the, the developer provides some stub code for this. And then we can just steer the um, generation of the synthetic code to take this code, include it into the general in the, to the synthetic code, and then we can execute it also on the platform itself to have a more realistic view on the platform if this code is already available. So this was the first part from my side. Thank you very much. And are there any questions? So far, no, but feel free to write in the chat or in the question and answer um, box if you have questions. Otherwise, we'll uh, get to them at the end. Maybe something will come up during the rest of the presentation. So feel free to write in the chats. Okay, next part. Uh, so we now come to the part where um, GLSI and Bosch are presenting the use cases we had in the project. And um, we talked about this already sometimes, but just to give you a small motivation and introduction for the motive use case. So when we started Ampere, the, the trend in the automotive domain was really to going from these dedicated EE um, functions and architectures where you have one function on a dedicated ECU or maybe two functions on a dedicated ECU to more centralized systems. So you're consolidating the small microcontrollers towards multi-core, many-core microcontrollers and microprocessor systems. And um, there's the, all the challenges that Ampere addresses in the non-functional part also are going back to these integration platforms, right? How can we cope with the parallelism that these offers? How can we deal with interference that is there? How can we um, really efficiently deploy uh, these systems onto these platforms and make integration also easier? And just an example that we had in the beginning of the project where we wanted to see, we need to, to understand what happens on the platform itself. So this is, um, a stub PCC version, um, a predictive cruise control version that we executed on a, a vehicle computer um, platform where we basically have a cyclic execution. I think it's every 500 milliseconds. You have some calculations here and then you're done until the next iteration of the period. And you're basically using the same core. It's really standard execution here. But since we have now our four core system with a, a DRAM in place, and we put some more load onto the system, so some really memory-intensive applications on all the on the other three cores. You can see that the execution pattern becomes right really more disruptive. So we going up from a twenty-one percent of utilization to a to a three point six higher utilization just because of interference from the other cores, and uh, sometimes even we miss deadlines depending on what the operating system also does was executed on a Linux system. And this is something you cannot really easily detect um, analytically. So we need to really understand what's happened on the platform. We need some mechanisms also to deal with it and understand it. And it gets even worse. This is a paper done by the group of uh, Marco Bertonia in 2017, where they also did this on an NVIDIA platform with a GPU. Then the interference can get even 10 times higher. So we need to understand this and we need to deal with it. And the question is, how do we achieve a high utilization, safety, reliability with less integration efforts? And with these integration platforms, we, we see that there are now not only a few suppliers providing software to this platform, there are multiple suppliers uh, providing software. We need to integrate everything there. Uh, we need to um, integrate software that is developed in isolation and also timing-wise, measured in isolation. Um, we want to reuse also existing functionality, create higher-level functionality, which motivates, um, pops up our communication architectures to have an easier integration process there. And of 
because as already said, we want to leverage also the performance of these platforms. If we have them, we want to use them. And um, we focus here in Ampere on leveraging really the performance of these platforms, exploiting other forms also maybe resilience like software replication instead of dedicated ASL hardware and all of the model-driven approach that we have an efficient design upfront during the development of the process to ease up the integration and certification at the end of the project. The Bosch use case looks like this. So we have this intelligent predictive cruise control, which is which calculates a future velocity based on the electric horizon. And it uses something like topology data, um, speed limits, and uh, this information. It adapts the speed according to variable speed zones when approaching bands. And the idea was here always to have um, fuel or energy efficient um, um, driving mode for electric and hybrid cars, and especially, and taking into account all the information that are ahead. This is this is basically the main component for the predictive cruise control that does the computation, and it takes data in this uh, case from different um, different components. For example, we have here a traffic sign recognition that provides data like recognized speed limit. And we take data from the adaptive cruise control that just says, okay, what is the speed the, the user wants to really have? What is the actual speed? And we determine the PCC speed limit set point that we want to have to have an efficient driving mode. We have also a powertrain control that is controlled by the ACC, and we have an operation strategy that also goes to power control to so have a more economic driving mode. And the interesting part from a software standpoint is that this is basically we, we see this as existing cyber physical systems that are already there, more like autos are classic systems. And we integrate some new um, systems, more autos are adaptive, like where we have a pub sub communication architecture, um, where data is, is, is really pushed through this pub sub um, architecture. And we glue this all together also with autos are adaptive or ROS2 and then here. This was the idea behind this integration use case. I will quickly go over the four components just to get you an idea how they look like. And then we go to the evaluation. So the powertrain control is a classic auto system. You have periodic tasks, you have sequentially executing, runnables. You have some fine grain labels where data is shared. We have two publicly available Amathea models in a, presented in the Waters chain. So you, everybody can download and, and see it. And everything is executed on a CPU and it has an ASL B safety level. And just to see how, how much elements are there, there are 21 tasks, 12,050 uh, functions, and 10,000 labels. So it's really a huge model, but this is a really fine grained model of this power chain control. We have an adaptive cruise control, which is also which is, has also some product driven activations, but also some data driven activations in between. So we have some sampling and pipelining effects there. Um, we have um, uh, four steps in between. So we have some pre-processing of the data, then some perception of the objects, putting this all together in a world model, and then derive some control behavior out of it. And there's also the potential to offloading some of these functions to the FPGA and GPU if possible. And uh, in this model, we have five tasks, one on runnables, 500 labels, a little bit smaller than the other one, but it's also a minor subset of a real system. We have a traffic sign recognition here, which is also just taking the, the video data, has some pre-processing, traffic sign detection, so just detecting first the sign and then do some classification about signs we are actually seeing. It has uh, mostly data-driven activations, except for the initial part for the sensor value, and there's potential also to offload something to the GPU. And finally, we have this predictive cruise control with a cycle of 500 milliseconds with uh, does some prediction and then uh, calculates an optimized directory optimization, which has not so many tasks, not so many runnables, but it's um, com uh, rather compute intensive. The evaluation in Numpair um, is, is was done on two platforms. One is Excelling's Ultra Scale. This is an interesting platform because it's also an FPGA on top of it. It has four A53 cores. And uh, we deployed here the system with a PyCoS hypervisor to have 
a Linux system on one side for some of the components for the ACC, the PCC and the TSR that are communicating via ROS2. And we have an Erica uh, OS on another partition, which is basically our safe island for this uh, powertrain control, where the where we, the colleagues also implement a bridge between micro ROS here and ROS2 here, so we can communicate from the Linux partition to the Erica OS ECM uh, via the PubSub mechanism that we provided here. We are also using open PM thread here to deploy um, the, the software to use the parallelism of the of the platform for the processors and the FPGA. And we do some uh, energy and real-time optimization in the analysis here. And um, yeah, this is how it looks like on the Sinex Ultra Scale platform. And we also have an NVIDIA Jetson platform where we have our system also described, which is also an interesting note, basically the same software model. There are no changes on the software. We just changed the part of the, um, we just changed the model of the hardware, basically. So this is also a nice reuse depending uh, that is happening in a pair. And there are no real adaptions there, except for the timing, of course, for the different cores. And um, there we deployed the whole system on this, on this, on the cores and the GPU, all is connected via ROS2, and there we use um, software replication for the ECM to fulfill the safety requirements that we do, modeled in the project. And we use here Open Ampere and CUDA, and we have two optimization optimizations: one for optimizing for the real time, and one for the minimum power that we can consume and still hold up all to all the deadlines that we have in the system. So this was apart from the automotive use case. Any questions? Yes, there's one question okay. here. So the synthetic data generation that you mentioned before, is that also that has, is, will be made available by the Ampere project? Yes, so um, parts of it are already available online. Um, let me see if I can directly see it here so what is already online is the, the ROS2 and the micro ROS generator um, also some the Eric OS stops are already there uh, Linux is there the framework itself the OpenMP and thread not yet let's but I think we make them also publicly available at some point for the project 